and welcome to my channel. Have you ever dealt with someone who complains all of the time? Well, grumbling and complaining doesn't take much. It does take something different, however, to rehearse the blessings of God. We're going to talk about it in today's video. Let's go. Hey everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of thatsundayschoolgirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for Sunday, September 15th. We are in week three of our new quarter. We've been studying the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but I love the Old Testament. I love the history and all of the learnings that come along with it. And guess what? This week is no exception. But before we get into the lesson, I've got to say hello to some very special people. If you're new around here, welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. This channel is now more than 21,000 subscribers strong. People who are just like you love God, love his word, and we are excited about the ministry of Sunday school. There are going to be four ways that you can engage with this video while you're here. The first thing I've got to do, though, is get you connected. So look down below. Make sure that you click the subscribe button that that's going to connect you to this community secondly there's a picture of a bell the notifications bell which gives you emails immediately when content is uploaded on this channel but also as you watch the video if you find it helpful please be sure everyone be sure to give it a thumbs up like and finally everyone anyone you can always leave comments below I love to hear from you say hello tell me how you found the channel or maybe leave me one of your own key learnings I only have one other thing to share this week. It seems like I've talked about it most of the year, and it is finally here. Next Friday and Saturday in the city of Denton, Texas, September 20th and 21st, is my very first Sunday School Conference, Step Summit 2019. Insert applause. Yay! Teachers from all over the country, literally all over the country, all backgrounds, many denominations are coming to the city of Denton, Texas for a time of intense and focus Sunday school training. I am, I'm literally not sleeping at night now. Last night I think I woke up at 1.45 and I got up and worked till almost 5.30 this morning because I think now it's just, I'm just all energetic and abuzz. So it has come together. It is finally time. There are really just a few seats left. If you are interested, I can squeeze you in, but materials have been ordered and the quantity is the quantity at this point, but I have just a couple of seats remaining. If you're interested though, you've got to let me know immediately. So please go to stepsummit.com, send me an email, but we're into the crunch now. So I'm excited about those of you who are coming and I promise you I'm excited about what God is going to do. I know what he's shown me and I know the passion that I have for helping to change the way that people see Sunday school. And so I am grateful for the opportunity to host and I look forward to seeing those of you all who will be in Denton. A popular question has been, will you be live streaming? The answer is unfortunately no, because the people who are coming have made the investment to be here, but but there may be ways that you're able to perhaps purchase the toolkit or the downloads after the conference is over. But I'll have to let you know that after we get through conference next week. In the meantime, we have, again, a great lesson this week. So make sure that you've got your TSSG notes, your Bibles, your pens, your handy dandy notebooks, because it's time for us to get into this lesson. Our lesson title is Bread from Heaven. The Bible basis is Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 8 and 13 through 15. The Bible Truth The children of Israel complained about being hungry, and God rains down manna from heaven. Our memory verse is verse 16, and the lesson name is that we will contrast God's provision in the wilderness with Israel's former slave masters in Egypt, reflect on the times we have complained about God's provision, and express thanks for the ways God cares for us. Okay, so it happened again this week, and I am deeply ashamed. A few weeks ago, I referenced a sitcom that I watch on reruns. It was good times. Thank you for those of you who didn't leave me out here by myself. And the lesson reminded me of a particular episode. Did it again this week. The episode that I thought about was entitled Snowstorm. And in it, Florida Evans is a bus driver whose bus becomes stranded 
in a snowstorm and she's got maybe three or four children with her and they go into a warehouse that's nearby just to have safety and coverage until the storm either blows over or someone finds them realizes that the bus is stuck but while they're inside they do everything to keep moving and try to stay warm they light a small fire she gets the children up and dancing because she doesn't want anyone to fall asleep in the cold but there is one small child there played by Kim Fields and she has an absolute moment of panic and she just screams we're going to die we're going to die of hunger we're going to die of this we're going to die of that we're going to die of coldnessness and everyone is trying to get her to settle down and realize that even though they were in a challenging situation they were not there to die we are looking at a group in this week's lesson who believes that they've been taken to a place to be left and to die. We're talking about our favorite people in the Old Testament, the children of Israel. So much that we've learned about them. If you've been a Sunday schooler for many years, we got, I think last year we had some Old Testament time where we followed their story and we know that they kind of had these ups and downs with their relationship, learning to trust God. At this point, though, we are looking in the book of Exodus. So the children of Israel have spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt, and God led them out of Egypt. He has now taken them, and he could have taken them the way of the Philistines, but they couldn't handle it at that time, so he leads them through. But at this point, the children of Israel haven't had to do a whole lot of work for their blessings. What do I mean? God has moved for them. He's moved on their behalf. He's blessed them. Their only job was to stand still and see the salvation of God. They were just to listen, to believe, obey, and to trust God. And as God worked on their behalf, it was God who took out an entire nation with 10 plagues, lessening the burden that Pharaoh had on the children of Israel. It was God who led them by a cloud during the day and led them by a pillar of fire by night. That was in chapter 15. And God also opened the waters and the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea delivering them once and for all from Egyptian captivity when they were being pursued. But again, this was all the hand of God. And we're studying this week in chapter 16. But before we get there, I want you to go back and note in chapter 15, just skim it. There has been a giant worship service celebrating and glorifying God for the deliverance and the miracle that he performed at the Red Sea. There was a song of victory and dance for delivering them from Pharaoh. And not only that, but what he was going to do in the future, taking them into the promised land. In fact, every tambourine player loves chapter 15. But in chapter 16, something shifts. They have forgotten about what God has done and how he's taken care of them because now they're a little bit hungry. And so we're going to see how they shift from praise to, quite frankly, panic and worry and fear. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 8 are our first passage of scripture. Verse 1 tells us that they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is in between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So again, this is after their deliverance from Egypt. And again, this is the day after a major worship service. Think about it like your own worship service or a convention, a time when God has met you in a powerful way. So high, so excited about God. But on the very next day, nobody was happy. Their praise has turned to panic and concern. Their old attitudes are coming into a new place with them. They've always been complainers and we're going to see that. So they come from Elam, and this has been an oasis for them in the desert. When they arrived there, the water there, quite frankly, was bitter. There were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, but they complained there because the water was bitter, but God sweetened the water source and kind of gave it a little honey kick. And God gave them rest and refreshment before going into the wilderness. But they don't see what God has done. They only see where they are now. They go to Sin, and even though it's spelled Sin, it's pronounced Sin. It's in the Sinai Peninsula. And let's look at the timing. 
We see from the lesson that it is in the 15th day of the second month after they're departing out of the land of Egypt. So they're roughly 30 to 45 days into their journey, and that's important to mark because we're going to see why they're starting to sort of panic about what's going on. They left on the 15th day of the second month, so that's how we kind of measure out time. And typically they would have taken about 30 days worth of provision or supplies with them in their travel. So now that we're looking at a 30 to 45 day window of being out, that means that they are starting to run out of the things that they need. They left with plenty of animals and plenty of supplies, but at this point it's been depleted. And they were in the wilderness at this point with no apparent source of provision. Here was my aha. We most often cannot and will not see God's answer in our own strength because their minds were only around what they knew they brought with them and the fact that it would not sustain them for what was ahead. They had only the confidence in what they had prepared, but what they could not see was that God was going to use this as an opportunity to grow them to a new place of trusting him in a new way. Here's another aha. It's about control issues. They needed to have control. And a lot of us feel the need to have control, to know what's going on. I'm one of those people. And I, I have to work on that because when we have to have control, that negates our ability to submit to God and to really know and acknowledge and respect that he is in control. Verse 2 shows us where the children of Israel start to grumble and complain. The King James says murmuring. In fact, I highlighted it. I probably see no less than eight or ten times that the word grumbling is mentioned. And when we see repetition in scripture, that is an emphasis so that we see these are a complaining people. And it's not just a few of the people. It tells us the whole congregation. This is not a congregation of 50 or 60 or 300 people. It's 2.5 million people who are dissatisfied. They are complaining about what they have and what they don't have. And they're complaining about their leadership. So the grumbling was coming out of their mouths. But it was also who they were. How do I know that? Because Matthew 12, 34 tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So their grumbling was everything that they had been stewing on on the inside. And their mouths were speaking distrust, distrust of their leaders. But we're going to see ultimately that it's distrust in God. In verse 3, the children of Israel said unto them, Would, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread up to the full and ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly for hunger. Their eyes were not on God. Their eyes were on their perceived lack. And that is wild after all that God had done for them. How could they possibly think so little of him right now? And here they are, they accuse their leader, first of all, of being a poor leader. You bring us out of Egypt to die. You brought us out here and we have nothing. They had no confidence in their leader. They had no confidence in God. And why would any of this have been Moses' fault? How could they even come to that idea? Well, perhaps it was because they were traveling through an area that Moses would have been familiar with from his 40 years in the wilderness, but they also were not accustomed to this type of travel or this level of trust. But here's where it gets really interesting, because suddenly life in slavery was better than where they were now. Was it really better? Let's look at this, because in their minds, here's how they remember things. They seem to remember themselves as living well. They identified three things. We had rest. We had satisfaction. We had abundance. How do I find that? First of all, they said we sat. You sat in slavery. You were sitting down in positions of rest. Okay, we'll talk about that. There was satisfaction in their minds. They talk about the flesh pots being filled with meat. I thought about a Brazilian steakhouse where you go and they just cut off meat until you flip over your card and tell them to stop. Just meat everywhere. And in their minds, we ate bread. Every day there was a big feast until we were full. In Numbers 11, and I include this in the notes, they actually go on and identify all of the foods that they've missed. And they were largely missing out on not only the food, but the spices, the way things tasted and were seasoned. In their minds, they were feasting every day in Egypt. But here's the reality. 
They were slaves. You were not enjoying lives of rest, satisfaction, and abundance. As a matter of fact, those all describe the place that God was actually trying to take them. But the enemy will do a job on your mind, causing you to look back and miss what God is doing up ahead. Here was their reality. They were slaves who actually worked hard, who lived under restrictions and limitations. They worked hard at the mercy of hard taskmasters. They were given restrictions, limited amount of food and resources. The limitations were even such that they had to make bricks out of straw. We see that in Exodus 5. So again, interesting because the enemy redefined slavery in their minds in a way that made them think that they were leaving, that they had left a land that was actually one of promise. The little that they received as slaves was suddenly made big in their own minds and something that they fondly remembered. I made a connection to our lesson two weeks back, remembering Lot's wife, when she looked back. Um, look back at what? What's behind you? When God is moving you, your eyes have to be fixed on what is ahead. Luke 9, 62 says that no man puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Here are my ahas from verse three. First, the enemy tempts us in the same way that the children of Israel were confused in their minds to look back and to remember fondly on the lives that we had when we lived in sin. He wants us to value that more than what God is doing. He wants us to evaluate enslaved lives and evaluate them and elevate them over the place that God has us now and to where he's taking us. The enemy will also make you look at your past and the things of the world and call them good. I actually heard someone say this week, oh, I had a good time when I was in the world. And I just wasn't sure how I felt about that because when I think about where we are now as people of God, everything about the life of a saint is better than when you were in the world, better than when you were slaves to sin. And the enemy wants to draw you in through your imagination, uh, causing you to remember the times in the words of another artist's song, cause you to create times and places that were never really that great anywhere except in your imagination. So they're not thinking rationally at this point. In fact, they accuse their leaders of some sick premeditated plot to kill them all. And again, I ask the question, really? Would God actually go through everything that he did to bring you this far to leave you to die? The question is, what kind of confidence did they have in their God? So I ask a question in verse four, what do you give to a complainer? Sometimes we want to write the complainer off, and the truth is complainers are hard to deal with. Like no one wants them around. They're a drag on what's going on. They shift the environment. So what do you do for a complainer? Well, God does just the opposite of what probably you and I would do. He responds to their complaining in an unexpected way. He is patient. He does not give them what they deserve. He gives them instead just what he gives to us, his grace. Again, God is going to use this moment to grow them up. They're going to move from receiving handouts that they didn't work for to a place of trusting him on a daily basis. And how does he do this? He's going to do it through his provision in the lesson title, Bread from Heaven. Every day, God is going to rain down bread from heaven. And there were just two rules that they had to follow with this bread. With this provision, they were to gather certain amounts each day and not pick it up on the Sabbath. We're gonna elaborate that on in just a bit. But pick up only what you need for you and your household. Don't keep any overnight because it's going to spoil. There would be worms. There would be a terrible stench. Take only what was required for your personal need. And that took a lot of trust because a lot of us like to get more and store up and get concerned about tomorrow. But God is trying to teach them, take no thought for tomorrow because tomorrow is going to take care of itself. He's going to take care of tomorrow. Here was my aha. God grows us up in our relationships and our relationship with him by putting us in positions where we are forced to trust him, where we're in situations where you say it's above me now. It's definitely in the hands of God. In verse five, God says that he is going to test them. What is he going to test? Again, he's testing their trust. And we just talked about the fact that they were to pick up only what they needed. And on the sixth day, they were to pick up double because they were not to work on the seventh day. Again, 
in this system with these two rules developing this trust, distrust was quickly revealed. Because again, those who took more than what was needed, we knew that by the stench, by the smell, by the evidence of the worms that were in the tent. So distrust was quickly revealed and God is teaching them what it means to walk with him. God knows what he's doing. I know that in our minds, we think we can help and figure it out, but he knows what he's doing. And this was all a part of God's plan. In fact, the same principle is later expanded as we look at um, the idea where they would collect crops for six years and not in the seventh year. And ultimately the idea, the law of the Sabbath would be formalized. In verses six through eight, I grouped those together. We're looking at Moses, who was God's chosen leader. And to complain about the chosen leader was in essence to complain about God personally. Here was a leadership observation for me. I first asked the question, how does it feel to be the person on the receiving end of complaints? And as a leader, how do we posture ourselves? How do we respond? And I look at the posture of Moses where he only rehearses what God tells him to say. So we've got to be mindful as leaders in ministry, as we're moving about when people aren't happy, that we remind them of what God said and keep them focused on what God is doing. Second leadership observation kind of connected to the same is that Moses would have had every opportunity and some would argue even a right to respond negatively when people were mistreating him. But he doesn't do that at all. In fact, he says, your complaints, basically, you're calling my name, but this isn't really about me. This is not on my shoulders at all. This is all about God. And he reminds him, I'm a man. Who am I that I could possibly feed 2.5 million of you all? God brought you here. He brought you this far. And you're complaining now because you don't trust him. Moses saw himself as what he was. He was the middleman, but God was going to show his glory. They would see the glory of God. And we talked about that glory being the manna, the bread that he would allow to come from heaven. God's provision would come daily from the sky. Here was my aha. They didn't see the bread yet. They didn't see manna, had never seen anything like that come from heaven. But God is always at work even when we don't see it. His plan is at work even when we don't understand it. And so God sends the manna as a visible sign of his presence in their everyday lives. Uh, we skip down to verse 13, but in between there, God hears their complaints in verse 9. The glory of the Lord appears in a cloud in verse 10. He commands Moses to let them know the rules, how they are to collect and what they're not to keep. And again, they're going to know that God has provided for them. In verse 13, we actually see the first Uber Eats or, do, or DoorDash. Uh, they have, in verse 3, remember, they miss the pots of meat, all of the provision of meat, and God provides meat for them. There are quails that come and cover the camp. And I looked at quails just a little bit. They uh, move from place to place, kind of in large groups. They're often low and slow flying birds. So they're not really hard to catch. And sometimes they can catch them in nets or catch a couple because they're moving so slow. But God provided the meat for them, that thing that they said they were missing so much. And in verses 14 and 15, this is where we see the manna that comes from heaven. It's like small white discs, and it's described to have looked like snow. It was a strange occurrence to the children of Israel. Again, when they saw this manna covering the ground, they asked the question, what is this? Because it was unfamiliar to them. And so they chose to name it, basically, what is this? Uh, the translation of manna comes from a word that sounds like the question, what is this? Some translations have also written it as a statement, or it could refer to a tamaris bush, which dropped a sticky white honey-like substance to the ground. So this manna was light and sweet, but very filling. Here was my aha. We are so quick to advise God on how to fix our issues, but God may just be working on something new, something unexpected, something unknown. He'll send solutions that cause you to say, what is this? So the manna was his provision so that Israel did not starve. 
The manna was given to them daily for the 40 years that they were in the wilderness until they reached the promised land. Reminded me of Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. God did just that. And here was a connection for me. Jesus is the bread of life. He is our bread from heaven. And to accept him, just like the children of Israel were sustained for their 40 years until they made it into the promised land, we have the bread of heaven to sustain us until we receive the provision and promise of eternal life. So Moses answered them, this is the bread that the Lord provided for you to eat. There are some other lessons that I got from the manna and I'm getting close to wrapping up. First, there are three life lessons that I see in the manna in terms of a model of our personal devotion. First, look at the frequency of the manna. It came daily. It was a daily reminder that God provides. And as we look at our personal devotion, we need that time with God, that connection with God on a daily basis. Look secondly at the timing. It was daily in the morning. They had to rise early to get what they needed for the day. Lazy people would have just been hungry because the manna melted when the sun came up at noon. So to put it off meant that you wouldn't get it at all. And my aha here is that it is so easy for us to kind of glaze over the morning. Uh, but there are things that come and complicate our day. So we should spend our time with God, have our devotion with him before anything else has the opportunity to complicate our day. The third thing is I noticed the posture that to pick up the manna off the ground would mean that they had to stoop or to bend or to be submitted. So that speaks to me about our attitudes and devotion being humble and submitted. So daily, early with humble attitudes should reflect our life of personal devotion. And then there are some Christ connections that I make in the manna. The first is that the manna was available and accessible to all. And just the same, Jesus, our bread of life, is accessible and available to all. Romans 10 and 9 tells us that. And the manna, like Christ, gives us nourishment and strength. And the manna satisfied them until they came into promise. And Jesus satisfies us just the same until we reach the promise. He satisfies us forever. If you look at the wilderness, it was a place of instruction. It was all about getting to that point of covenant relationship with God to know that he would deliver, protect, lead and provide for his children. All he required of them is the same thing he wants from us today is trust. God wants us to experience our lives as in places of rest, abundance and fullness. That's what he promised them into the land, the promised land. That's what they were looking forward to. And today we get the same rest, abundance and fullness. But that is filled for us through the true bread of life, which is Jesus Christ, our bread from heaven. That's our lesson. I'm going to give you my key learnings and then we're going to get out of your hair. First thing, don't let life circumstances take your victory song. Be reminded that they just had the victory in chapter 15 and they move from praise to panic in chapter 16. Don't let life circumstances snatch what you know about God. The next thing is that God is patient with us. He doesn't give us what we deserve, but he shows us continually his grace. In fact, we should never tell God, give me what I deserve because we really don't want that. His grace is sufficient and it covers so much. Next, to experience lives of victory, we must avoid complaining and rehearse the blessings and benefits of God daily. Remember, it doesn't take much to grumble or complain, but that speaks to who you are on the inside. It speaks to lack of trust when you grumble and complain. Yes, we can take our cares and concerns to God and cast them on him, but we must ensure that we have attitudes that remember who he is and rehearse the record of what he's done and not give credence and credit to the circumstances that want to overtake us. Don't forget what you should remember, and that's that God has been and is good. We have to fight actively against spirits of unbelief and distrust. Guard against having a selective memory. memory. That's what the children of Israel had. Remembering select things about, Israel, about Egypt that certainly became so great. Focusing on the good and not the bad will help us to remember what we need to remember. Watch placing unfair burdens on leaders. Even when things aren't going well organizationally, we have to look at process and less at people. When you focus on process, you're able to 
change up things and get the work done in a different way versus looking to place a blame on a leader. The first step in going back is looking back. So we talked about this two weeks ago. When God delivers you from something, don't look back. It wasn't that great. That's why God allowed you to move. His grace is a gift and it is free.com. We must maintain our relationship with God. Our relationship is built with him on trust. It must be daily. Seek him early and do it in a way that is humble. If we don't maintain our relationship with God, the things of the world become so much more appealing. Life circumstances are designed to condition us to trust in our God. Why? Because he wants us to trust him, not just when we have a need, not just when we think about him, but daily we should trust him. And he puts us in situations to stretch our faith so that we do. Remember that he knows what he's doing and his provision is evidence of his presence in our lives. His provision satisfies all of our needs. He knows what we need before we even ask for it. And so today, our manna is spiritual bread, and we receive that through God's word. We too should gather it early, take it in, and take it all before we begin our day. This is all I have this week for the lesson. Again, I hope that you had a great time in your study, that you got some very um, helpful information out of the video. And of course, if I have something, or if you have something that I didn't have in my notes, please leave me a note down below so that I can add it. In fact, I've been started to share some of your notes even on my social media. So uh, you may see your information on, but I always give you credit for it. Uh, but yes, please leave me notes down below. Again, just a few seats remaining. If you want to come to step, I can slide you in. But you got to hurry. That's all. Everyone have a great weekend. I'll see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody.